And we'll just trust that God will speak to our hearts and uh, revive us from his word today. And first of all, we want to thank all of you for your prayers um, concerning our travel this past week. Had a very nice tour of London and nice to be there during the Christmas season. Very nice. And uh, most of all, we appreciated the hospitality of the Lighthouse Church while we were there and the people of the church and uh, beautiful people. They're very receptive to the Word of God and very generous to us. We really love the people there of the, at the Lighthouse Church. Also had a wonderful time in Canterbury, and uh, actually we have friends there too. Went out to dinner with some of our friends there at the house in Canterbury, and also in London as well. But um, And then too, we had people come down from Scotland to Canterbury. <clears throat> they were, had dinner with us there in Canterbury, and so had a very nice trip. Then, of course, when we went to the cathedral, I couldn't believe some of you people saw us at the cathedral there in Canterbury. We went to the cathedral twice <clears throat> this past week, and then also Saturday we were ended up at the cathedral downtown to see the Messiah, so we were at the cathedral three different times here this past week. But here we are two weeks from Christmas, if you can believe that. And every Christmas season, uh, I wonder what I can say that hasn't been said. Um, something new and original about Christmas. But uh, being that Christmas only comes once a year, well, I guess uh, uh, anything I say would just be a refresher. And hopefully will cause us to appreciate the season a little bit more. Actually, I found a message that I preached 19 years ago. I don't know if anybody here would remember that or not. Uh, maybe some of you would. Um, but um, I thought it would be safe to preach again. Every 19 years you can preach the same message over again, right? Um, maybe I revised it a little bit. But when I think back to my elementary school days, and so we're going back over 70 years ago. I mean, we had plays at school, public school, portraying the birth of Christ in the manger and the wise men and the shepherds and even sang Christmas carols, uh, hymns, and this was public school. My, how things have changed, huh? In fact, my grandmother used to tell me now we're going back 120 years ago, public school, how they used to uh, read The Pilgrim's Progress for English Literature. This is public school. And I think only judgment and revival are going to bring us back on course again. But the Christmas season gives us a fresh opportunity to appreciate the gift that was given to us from heaven. Amen? And, I mean, the Heavenly Father gave his Son, who was with him from the beginning of time. God became a man, became one of us, as the song goes, to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. And that's what it says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Hebrews 2.14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So God had to become man in order to atone for the sins of mankind and to restore him to the paradise that was lost. Now, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says of Mary, 
and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, I don't think that man fully understands what was lost. I mean, man was created to be an eternal being, and man was given command over all of the creation that was here on earth. And picking up in Hebrews chapter 2 again, in verse 7 and 8, it says, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over all the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Originally, God put everything under the control of mankind, but then something changed. That was man's first estate. He was crowned with glory and honor, made to have dominion over everything, set over all the works of the creator, all things subject to him. And actually, this is a quote from Psalm 8, and as a psalmist put it in this psalm, that all things were put under his feet. Man had control of everything. That was the original plan and intention. But something has changed. But now we see that not all things are under him. And he lost the dominion. He lost eternal life. Duped out of his inheritance. And he was brought to ruin because of disobedience. So man lost the dignity, the honor, and the crown of anointing, and the authority that was given him in the beginning. So in short, man lost everything, didn't he? He lost everything. So now man has to work by the sweat of his brow. Although Brother Ed back there just retired, so he doesn't have to work by the sweat of his brow anymore. So anyway, uh, it's all part of the curse. Man is starting to die, feel pain, feel sickness. We even start to feel old age. Um, Don't look at me. Okay, I'm not looking at you. <laughs> well, I start to feel it a little bit, um, even if my wife doesn't. So, um, But uh, that was all part of the curse. And the worst part is that he's sentenced to death. Man lost much in this transaction here that took place in the garden. He became poor. But now we see Jesus. Thank God this is what the holiday is all about. In verse, sorry, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews 2, 9. It says, but we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels. Same idea. For the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Same set of circumstances, same tests, same temptation. Only this man passed the test. He passed. And because he was found worthy, he was allowed to substitute for us. Because he was worthy, he was allowed to pay the penalty for all of mankind, for all of time, that is, for all that would receive it. You get the picture here? Isaiah describes our enemy in chapter 14, in 15 through 17, as one that destroyed the cities, refused to open the door of his prisoners. And even today, the cities are destroyed because of vice and greed and drugs and violence and vulgarity and immorality, ruined uh, because of the influence of the wicked one. So man was deceived, 
stripped and robbed. He was exploited and put on death row with a sentence of doom and destruction. That was our lot prior to the coming of Christ, although God did have provision in the Old Testament as well for people to be redeemed through sacrifice, through going through a certain ritual that was all pointing to Christ. But God always made provision for man to be redeemed in spite of all of that. But we see Jesus. He became one of us in order to redeem us, to save us from Satan's power when we were gone astray, to restore the dominion and the honor and the crown and the paradise lost. You know, there is a, is a paradise on the other side. And for the saint, when we cross the river, there's a beautiful paradise that goes beyond the original Garden of Eden. And uh, so actually, when the saints are ready to leave this world, many saints look over across the river and they see, and they can leave on a joyful night, note. Now, in First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 8, we find a good analogy of the redemption story. So... 1 Samuel 2, 8, just the latter part of the verse, it says, uh, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill, garbage pile, to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. He lifted us up from the guttermost to inherit the uttermost. Amen? And you see uh, that he's enabling us to recover from this curse and to reign in life and throughout eternity. This was a ministry of Christ. And, you know, as we're told in Isaiah 61 and verse 1, here's the ministry of Christ. And he says, in fact, he quoted this in Nazareth. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. Unto the meek he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's the ministry of Christ to redeem man from the, from the garbage pile to enable him to inherit a throne and glory. That's the redemptive power of our God. So Christ came to set us free from sin and eternal death. And not only that, but to make us restorers as well. You know, the world is in a crisis. And, uh, you know, as Jesus said at his time, the field is white. The, the laborers are few. We have nobody to send. We're in a crisis. I was sharing this morning with Pastor Josiah that one of our drivers in London, a Christian man, and we've known him from the past, and he gave us a first-class tour. Um, I mean, this man was professional. But uh, he was telling us about one syndicate of churches there in London. The Elam churches are not connected to the Elam that we know in New York. But he said there are 200 Elam churches in the London area with no pastor. Can you imagine that? 200 churches without a pastor. That's crisis, folks. We need to see revival just so we can raise up people to send out and fill some of those positions. We need to see revival. But to make us restorers as Christ himself was. Let's look at another portion from Psalm 113. Psalm 113, beginning in verse 5. It says, 
Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high, who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? That's kind of interesting. Humbleth himself to behold things in heaven. That's how high our our God is, much higher than the heavens. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He took us from the garbage pile and, and gives us the ways and the means to be a prince throughout eternity. Amen. That's the real story of the season. Amen. The Son of God becomes poor, becomes human, leaves the ivory palaces and the choirs of angels and all of the riches of heaven, allows himself to become an embryo in the womb of a woman, to become poor, and to identify himself with fallen man, to experience infirmity and the weakness of a human being. So he identified himself with poverty, the working class. He got slivers in his hands like everybody else working in the carpenter shop. I'm sure he hit his thumb with the hammer once in a while too because he was human. He was a son of man. But he had to become man in order to die because God cannot die. So he had to become a physical man in order to pay the penalty for a psalm. Looking at Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And also in Second Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet, for your sakes, he became poor. I mean, he was from the beginning. He was with the Father. Nothing was made that was not made through him. He was there in the beginning of time. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Christ became poor to enable us to become rich. Spiritually. Amen? To enable us to recover from the power of the enemy. I mean, at times we've ministered in poverty-stricken countries. Um, gone to places very poor. One place we used to call the Valley of the Lepers. It was, it was, it kind of reminded us of the movie there. But, um, I remember a place in Guatemala, there was a church right on the end of the dump, and people were burning garbage there to stay warm. Were you with me there? Okay. Um, They were burning garbage, and even the dogs were looked like they were gaunt and sitting in a big circle and um, looked like they were going through some kind of a ceremony there. But in the church, you could feel the warmth, and you could feel the richness of of the Spirit of God in the church. Outside, people were living in a dump, burning garbage just to stay warm. Interesting thing about uh, this place. Uh, in fact, I said to the pastor in the church, I said, do you ever try to go out there and get some of these people into the church? And he said, yes, we have. And he said, "If he said, would you believe that many of these People that are living here were one-time ministers who are backslidden. Um, But there was a richness and a warmth inside the church and a joy and a peace and an atmosphere of the church. Um, We ministered in another church in, in Honduras, and I think you were with me on that trip, Jane. And such a richness... In the spirit, um, very poor, poverty, 
all over the place in that village. And, um, and yet, they enriched us. They gave us such beautiful prophecies in this place. And they were, we were like gods, like, you mean you left America to come down to minister to us in this lowly place? But they actually enriched us with beautiful prophecies. They were like the church in Smyrna saying, we're poor, we have nothing. And yet God was looking at them and saying, but you're rich. And they were. There was a richness in that place. We went to another place in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, one of the precincts of that city, that part of that city was called Garbage City. And there was a church right in the, you know, in the midst of Garbage City. And when we say Garbage City, we mean it was Garbage City. People pilfered through the garbage to stay alive, I think, there in the city. I don't know as we ministered in a church, Pastor Swerp was with me at the time. But still, you could feel the warmth in the church. And, and you know, you see, Christ makes all the difference, all the difference. But today, Christmas is a quite a commercial holiday. It's a material extravaganza here. Far cry from the lowly birth, the humbling years in Nazareth. You know, actually, uh, I don't think sometimes my wife can believe this, but I appreciate growing up being poor. We were on the poor side of town, so to speak. We had nothing. Um, But you know what? I appreciate that because it helps me to relate a little bit and um, to appreciate what God has done in our lives through all of that. And so I just thank God for the way that we were developed. You know, my granddaughter always gives me a a big candy cane for Christmas uh, stick, peppermint stick. Because I used to joke about when Christmas, that's all I got was a peppermint stick and a, and a, a 500 word puzzle and part of the pieces were missing from the puzzle. So, you know, after you work on the puzzle and get it almost through, through, you realize, uh, some of the major pieces are gone. But, uh, that was Christmas. But, uh, Christmas is not about things, is it? It's not about Santa coming. Santa never left me anything anyway. But it's about God becoming man, isn't it? God becomes man. And picking up again with some more scriptures in Philippians 2. And beginning in verse 6. And this is referring to Christ who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Those in heaven, those in hell, and because of that righteous act, God has given him a name above every name, and every knee will bow before him in eternity. In fact, um, Mohammed will bow before Christ and Stalin and Hitler and Confucius and Socrates and all of the people that were known in history will bow before Christ. There's no other name under heaven whereby men may be saved. Acts 4.12 And God will not accept any other means of salvation. 
my grandmother was once telling me. She said, well, everybody's trying to find their own way to God with their religion. I said, no. There's only one means to find God, and that's through Christ. And he became the once-for-all sacrifice for mankind. All other religions are demonic, perhaps with the exception of Judaism, but they too are lost without Christ. But that child that was born in a manger was to become the once-for-all sacrifice for all people for all time. His name brings comfort and joy. Amen? And healing and deliverance. In the name of Jesus, the whole book of Acts bears witness to the miracles that Jesus did. Um, Sometimes I think even when people see miracles, they don't believe, but The Apostle John summarizes it in a verse. He says in John 20 and verse 31, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ. All of these miracles that took place. The Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Thou shalt call his name Jesus For he shall save his people from their sins. In other words, deliver them from the power of sin. Some people kind of twist that around, not coming to save us in sin. He's coming to save us from sin, to deliver us from the power and the bondage of sin. Amen? To set us free from sin so that the sin nature no longer controls us. And that was the word that the angel gave to Joseph. Here is Joseph. He's contemplating divorcing his wife, Mary. Of course, they, the wedding espousal was a one-year contract, and it was a binding contract, and they were considered man and wife during that espousal period, even before they came together. And here is his espoused, who he is suspecting. I mean, here she is pregnant. And that can only happen one way. He felt that she had been unfaithful. But then the angel comes to Joseph and says, no, don't put her away. Don't divorce her. Because the child that she is bearing is the son of God. So that had to be something for Joseph, too. I mean, Joseph must have gone through quite a traumatic time. Matthew one nineteen and 20. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from sins their sins. So man is lost apart from the redemptive power of that act. That's what the Christmas season is about. God, the son becomes mortal so that he could die, so that he could pay our penalty for us. And not only that, he became mortal for another reason too. He became mortal so that he could feel the weakness, the infirmity, the temptation that human beings go through in this life. There is nothing that we go through that he can't relate to as our high priest. Nothing that he can't intercede for because he feels the infirmity and the temptation that we go through. Amen? Anything that we go through, say, oh, 
God couldn't experience. Christ couldn't really relate. Yes, he can. He can relate to everything, every temptation. Yet without sin, he can relate to the suffering of mankind and intercede accordingly. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. That's what it's about. Yet without sin. So this is why there's joy and comfort in the Christmas season. Not because of it being a commercial holiday. Or because of the holiday hype. But because our Lord Jesus Christ became a man. To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Well, the shepherds saw him, they believed. The wise men saw him, and they believed. The just one saw him and believed. The prophetess saw him and believed. And the common people heard him gladly. Do you see him? Do you hear him? Do you receive him? And actually that's going out to the larger audience today, but his name is wonderful. Amen? That's what the true Christmas season is all about. God becomes man so that he could atone for our sins, and not only that, he ever lives to intercede for us, make intercession for us. There is no other means of salvation except through him, through his name. Amen.